We went and met with Minority Leader Jim Durkin just as he was packing up his office. The Republicans have nominated Representative Tony McCombie to replace him in the next two-year term in the super minority. But before he left, we wanted to hear his perspective from the Republican side. What message did voters send and what message did politicians hear during the election? Speaker Welch said some nice things about you uh, as you step away as minority leader. He also said the election results showed Republicans a few lessons that maybe extremism uh, isn't a winning strategy. Do, do you see any truth in that? I see 100% truth in that. We have allowed the, the far-right extremist to control the primary, also to control the messaging in Illinois. And it doesn't work, particularly where I live in the suburbs. The areas that we were competing in the collar counties in the suburbs don't want extremists. They want people who have a moderate position from government. And even though we had candidates that were moderate, we were defined under the Donald Trump and Darren Bailey narrative. And that was a failure and it hurt us. Whose fault is that? Well, I would just say that uh, a lot of it has to do with the right wing. We have lost so many people in the Republican Party who have turned into independents. And that just allows just the far right, uh, the far right of the party to control who is going to be nominated for statewide elections. And we should have learned something on Tuesday that you cannot nominate a Darren Bailey and expect to win in the suburbs and the car counties when he has an extreme position on everything. So is the Illinois Republican Party a party of ideas or a party in search of ideas? Well, I tell you what, we have good ideas, but none of it broke through. What we, we were outspent. That's one thing. But every one of us, were, we were kind of thrown into the same, same mixing bowl by most people in Illinois, and particularly in the areas. That we're competing as part of the Trump, Bailey, Republican Party. And it was very difficult to break free from that. For as long as I've covered you, uh, you've always sort of not wanted to engage the national political discussion as That's much correct. in Illinois. No. But, but you're a McCain I'm Republican. I'm a John McCain Republican. Not Absolutely. a Trump Republican. That's correct. And Trump spoke to a wing of the party, the, the working class base of the new Republican Party, in a way that I don't know the lawyer, lobbyist, insider Republican class ever connected with. No, that's correct. But the fact is that fell apart after he lost the election. We're a nation that we have to accept uh, you know, winners and losers. He lost the election, and he kept uh, flaming the, the, the embers about the, the big steal. And when January 6th came about, everybody watched that, and that will go down as one of the worst times in American history for generations to come. And what did he do? He did nothing. And it's still, I'll wait to see what the committee does on, on his participation, but he did nothing to stop this revolt against our capital, against our democracy, that is when he lost it. And he had just, he is now, the people that he had brought in who felt that they never had a voice, they're like, this is not the type of government that I want. And he was left with the extremes and the fringes, and they're still on it. The election deniers, the January 6th sympathizers, and also everybody believes that, you know, that this election still was stolen. And he still is continuing with that. And he is, you know, it's just unfortunate that he can't accept a loss. And he should be doing it for the, for, for, the, for the Republican Party in the country. There is so much fatigue with Donald Trump. And David Brooks said it uh, particularly well the other day. He said, we, hopefully we've, we've gotten, we've, we've broke our fever on Donald Trump. But he is a person that had his opportunity. He just can't accept that he has lost a race. But people who are following him and people who continue to fall on a sword for him need to realize that he would never do the same for them. You just, but you, I understand the part, the, part uh, the point you're making about the relationship between politicians and other politicians within the right. party, but there's also that relationship between the politician and the base. You can't win without voters. Correct. And Donald Trump did turn out voters in greater volumes. How, how do you keep his base and ditch him? Well, you know what, time's gonna tell. I don't think that the former president has good days ahead. 
and obviously him moving up his announcement to run for the presidency may have something to do with the investigation that is going on with the Department of Justice. But I will just say this, that there are other good conservatives out there. Such as? Such as Ron DeSantis. You don't I see think, him as another version or iteration of Trump? No. What I did you think about his busing migrants from Texas to Florida, flying them to Martha's Vineyard to trick them? Look, that's part of the business that we're in. Uh, I don't consider that an extreme, but you know what? There's been so many issues regarding immigration. The Democrats have had the bully pulpit for so long. They want to make, make all kinds of noise about being a sanctuary city or sanctuary state. Uh, you know what? Fair game. But I don't consider that being a, you know, a disqualifier for Ron Santos Or Nikki Haley, I think, is an outstanding, outstanding person. I spent some time with Mike Pence over the summer. He's a very honorable man. These are all very conservative individuals that will still be able to appeal to the base but we have to, people have to look in the rearview mirror with Trump and understand that his days are over. That Maybe. we have to be able to give the party over to the next generation. This is a line I never thought I would use in an interview with uh, leader Jim Durkin, but let's steer it from national politics back to Illinois for a minute. Sure. Uh, because I, I understand you're making a point there, but on Illinois, when you look at the election results from this last November, Amendment 1, the Workers' Rights Amendment, polled higher than every statewide Democrat in almost every single county. In very few instances did Democrats poll higher than the Workers' Rights Amendment. What does that tell you about the electorate in Illinois, and what, should that, what signal should that send your caucus about the future of its relationship with labor? I've spent a lot of time over the past four years trying to repair some of the problems and uh, you know, build the bridges that we lost under Bruce Rauner. And we did. And you know what? I, I, under Governor Pritzker's first session, I worked with him, and I also worked with, uh, you know, the building trades on the, on the capital program. That was a, a very important step for us to move back in that direction. But I will say in the Constitutional Amendment, quite frankly, most people didn't know it was in it. It sounds good in its face, but the fact is most people don't understand what the short-term, long-term implications are, and quite frankly, neither do I. And everybody's got their own theory on it, but it sounds good on its face. But some of these, these Constitutional Amendments, if you dig into it and you really try to play out different scenarios, you're not sure if you're what you voted for is what you expected. I, I understand you could, a lot of people could interpret it, lawyers could have all kinds of opinions about sure. what it actually means, but the, the spirit seems to be there. The votes seem to be there. That polled really well. Of course, it's a blue state. That's well, it's a what union we have state. To, it's a union state, it's a blue state, and figure out a way to work with labor, particularly the building trades. That is what we lost touch under Bruce Rauner. And again, I said I've spent a little time over the past four years trying to repair those relationships. Because a lot of the men and women that work in those building trades, if you think about the profile of them, they're conservative Republicans when it comes to most of the issues. But when it comes to labor management issues, well, if we continue to take a position contrary to them, we're just losing out. You and your resume, your background, you were uniquely qualified to comment on the end of cash bail. Yes. And you hammered the Democrats over the Safety Act, the end of cash bail. Did voters buy it? No. No, they didn't. Did you overplay your hand? No. It's reality. This, I'm trying to warn people about exactly what they should expect and what's in this bill. So and voters I, just didn't hear enough of that message? I, I, you know what, as I felt that that was a, you know, the economy and the safety act, public safety, were one and two. And that is what our polling showed. And I can only rely upon polling and also the information I'm getting at the door from my candidates. And everything was about the economy. It was about crime. But when I find out after the election that more people are concerned about the, the future of the democracy of this country because of what's going on with Trump and also the, the January 6 hearings, but also him sticking his nose back into this process, that's a greater concern to people. And you know what? If that's what it is, so be it. But we were right on the issues. We were right on the economy. We were right on public safety. We were right on parental involvement with their children's lives. These are the things that I would say, resonated so strong over the last four years, but we lost on election day because of extremism and also an extremism is part of the Trump, part of the Bailey narrative. You're still, you, you still, you're still here. You're still a member. Correct. Uh, the, maybe there's a passing of the torch uh, in, in the days or hours to come to Correct. Tony McCombie. I think it looks like she has the votes. At, while you're here, Speaker Welch just told us moments ago he's committed to seeing a bill advance that will clarify the Safety Act before January 1st. Is there any version of that bill that is not just repealing the whole bill that you could vote for? Well, they've never invited myself nor anybody from my caucus to any of these, these meetings that they're having, these working, working groups. 
I would strongly suggest to Speaker Welch to allow myself and also some people in my caucus who've actually tried cases like myself, understand the criminal justice system, to provide some type of uh, you know, our thoughts. Let me give an example. Two years ago, Representative Slaughter presented a bill that was going to outlaw deception during interrogations of juveniles. I'm a prosecutor. That doesn't sound like tough on crime. I worked it and I rewrote the bill for him. I did it and I was the co-sponsor on that bill. And I made a good concept and I turned it into a great bill. And it got overwhelming support in the House of Representatives. That's what I bring to the table. And I hope that Speaker Welch would learn from that episode, that moment from a few years ago, that I'm not here just to say no to everything. I have the ability and I have the, the, the background to be able to turn something that I consider a bad product into something that's workable, that's fair. Could this be your final act to I would have just say that I would, I would welcome the opportunity. And I, if that's the case, I would, I would be honored to do so. But I have to be invited to the table. Which criminal defendants or which charges should automatically or clearly in that new law become part of a judge's discretion for pretrial detention in jail or not? We've had this big discussion on what is a detainable and non-detainable case, non-detainable or offenses. And people, the governor said there's no such thing as a non-detainable offense. No, well, sorry, governor, you invented it. Well, a misdemeanor it. would be a one. Misdemeanor is, I'm not concerned about right. that. But when we have a lot of people that have been, you know, we use the examples of kidnapping, strong arm robbery, arson. But to me, no narcotics case, no matter how big or small, can ever be detained. I was a special prosecutor in the narcotics unit. I spent a lot of time investigating gangs and cartels back in the 90s. And to say that a person who's going to be charged with trafficking kilos of heroin and fentanyl would not qualify for a detention hearing because, one, they are not, it's not a forcible felony, even though some of them are non-probationable. They would have can, to establish... Can I just ask a quick follow-up sure. question? Because I, don't most of those suspects or defendants carry weapons? And using a, a weapon in the commission of that crime, doesn't that make it detainable because they're, it's a high... Higher charge, no? It's not a UUW. It would be it'd have to be a, a, a. I don't. It would be. It's a class three felony, along with the class X. I don't believe that's the case. But a lot of these cases, just someone who is charged in one of these busts that we see on the highways. I live right off the heroin highway over in 88. Mm -hmm. We see them all the time. Where it's, sometimes there are firearms, whether that they can tie that up to upgrade. But if they don't, just the sheer fact that someone is trafficking, or someone. is delivering a, a, you know, a, a huge drug deal, that the only way they can be detained if they are deemed to be a flight risk. And under this law, you cannot use that person's background on skipping out in court cases or prior warrants to establish that they're a flight risk. It's an impossible standard to meet. So, so you'd like to see that standard with, expanded or clarified on the flight risk? I think that we have to be realistic about some of these offenses because most of these cases which are not going to be detainable in the future, uh, people are being held because they've got very, very serious criminal history. They've got bad backgrounds and they have flight risks. They've had prior violent crimes. You can't consider that again when these starting January 1st for these non-detainable cases. You can only determine whether or not they're a flight risk. Uh, you told me off camera that you'd be voting for Tony McComby to become the new House That's Republican correct. leader. Uh, do you have any interest in being a backbencher? You know what? I'm getting through this process right now. It was, a, it was a, a bittersweet decision that I made, but it was the right decision for me, right decision for the caucus. Uh, I will just say this, that uh, uh, I'm looking forward to working with uh, Tony McCombie, giving her some guidance, and the future of my, my time in the General Assembly, I'll be making a decision on that pretty soon. But, you know, this is a, I'm not ready to make any announcement on that. I want to still be part of putting together good policy for the state of Illinois in some capacity. I appreciate that answer. W would you be making this same announcement now had House Republicans picked up five seats and not lost five seats? I made a commitment to myself in the primary that I had to win 48 seats. Hold on and pick up three. I fell short. If I would have picked up, if I would have hit that 48 and gone above and beyond that, I'd still be here. But I had to, that was a commitment I made to myself and also to my family. And I realized that not only that I come close, we just failed miserably. Everybody did throughout the nation. It's time that 
for me to say that I leave under my own terms with no reservations, but also now to give somebody else the opportunity to uh, look at this process with a new set of eyes, new energy, a new face, and hopefully we'll be able to restart this process and put their House Republicans in a good spot. And if I'm doing some rough math there, it sounded like you were also just saying you just didn't want to be in the super minority anymore. Maybe an easier job in the minority at least. You know what? I've had a great, I've had a great run. But you know what? There comes a time in your life when you know that you've got to move on. And it's a gut check time. And I did. I made that decision. And I'm happy with it. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Mark. A swan song from House Republican leader Jim Durkin, Tony McCombie taking his place as of today.